Welcome, everybody. My name is Ray Obispo. I'm the president of Fonz HR Hampton Roads chapter. And this is a very special moment as we celebrate um, Asian Pacific Islander um, Heritage Month. And this is such a great group of people. Um, I feel like we're all family here, which we are, because I've known all of you for most of my life, really, at this point. So this is uh, really good to see people's faces. And I really wish at some point soon we'll all be together and doing a, a toast like we know how to do. I know Jeffrey knows how to do it. But um, this is really great to be here today. So a um, couple of things before I want to get started. This is a really the, the spawn of what we started last year, Alan's brainchild with Fonz Now. This is actually the, uh, the, the birthday of when it started, which was May 25th, uh, 2020. And as you guys know, there was, uh, there was a need in terms of community engagement and also community programming. And the way that we all had to adjust in the year 2020 is now going to be the part in which how we do things in 2021. So I'm really honored to be uh, part of this Zoom. I'm really honored to be uh, listening to our uh, distinguished guest speaker. And I'm really honored to be part of this really great group of people who are, we all are community folks. We all uh, know what it takes to, uh, to build community and we uh, take uh, our actions prove it in the past, now, and definitely into the future. So as we move forward, I just re wanna remind folks uh, what this month is all about. So um, in 1992, Congress designated this month as APIA month. And I never knew the reason why they chose May, but I found out a little bit before uh, this meeting started with some light research. Essentially, the reason why they chose May is because in eight, uh, 1843, is when the first Japanese Americans came to the United States. And also in 1869 is when the Transcontinental Railroad, Railroad was finally completed. And as we all know, a lot of that was uh, done through the, uh, the backs and hard work of the Chinese immigrants who came here to the United States. And as we continue on the legacy of Asian Americans here in um, our country, we're, for, we're forging uh, our own path path as Filipino Americans by honoring the past and also moving forward with that knowledge. So I'm really happy that you guys are here today. It's great to see everyone's faces. And I, you know, one, one the only regret I, I do have is that I wish we were all together. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate that. Um, if you guys would, as uh, we now know about Zoom, uh, make sure that you guys uh, remain muted as the guest speaker is uh, speaking or any of the speakers really. And then we'll try to monitor the, monitor the chat as best as possible um, for any, any questions. So uh, I'm gonna get, turn it over to uh, Dr. Alan Brigano. Alan, you're up. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending this uh, last minute, I call it last minute type of session. But before we start, let's start with our, we have a tradition before all our Zoom meetings and that's a moment of silence. So let's bow our heads. Think about those that can't be with us today, tonight, especially those that left the Philippines, who came to America to provide us with a roof over our heads, food in our stomachs, and the many opportunities that were denied to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, on that note, what we usually, what we found um, when we started to do our Zoom journey, uh, we, it took us six weeks to figure out a nice format. And like I said, that's tradition where we start our, with a moment of silence. Another tradition is that uh, we try to pass out information prior to the actual Zoom meeting so people could read some uh, articles and uh, the bios of the speakers so that there'll be uh, less time. So. I wanted to uh, share with you what we got. Is can you guys see that? Yeah. Hello. Can you guys see that? We're mute. Yeah, we can see it, Alan. We can see it. Oh, okay. Uh, so these are some of the resources of the state of Asian Americans. This is the population. Um, we're number three now as far as Filipino Americans. The Indian Americans jumped up. Um, these are articles uh, uh, that's explaining 
a lot of the Asian hate that's going on at this time. Uh, nice article there on the Filipino American nurses. And uh, like I had to underline that, that figure where uh, according to a survey published in September by National Nurses United, the largest nurses union in the United States, 67 Filipino nurses have died of COVID-19. That figure was pulled from public obituaries and is around one third of the total registered nurses who have died nationwide, though Filipinos make up only 4% of those nurses overall. Here's an article, uh, We Did Not Sign Up to Die by a Filipino American nurse. And this is the two um, nice articles on Vilma um, Kari, the, the New York City uh, Lola that got uh, uh, beat up in front of a hotel and the doorsman just shut the door. Um, this is the wonderful bio for our guest speaker tonight, Professor Francis Tanwell Aguas. There's a bio, this is a real nice article about him. And also his uh, pet peeve, I call this pet peeve, this is our, <laughs> his uh, website, Aguas Art Inc. This is our chapter. Oh, any, any, all this blue thing that you see here, those are called hyperlinks. Uh, Arnell taught me about, our, <laughs> about hyperlinks. All you do is click on it and it'll just take you there. So I thought that's pretty cool. Uh, Fonz now, we have a YouTube channel so that you could see all the, uh, the shows that we've done last year. Also, we also put in some programs we, we did back in the 90s and even um, the drill team back in, the FYA drill team back in 1985. So you can sift through those. Uh, Fonz National website. And uh, in case you guys didn't know, the 2022 Fonz National Conference will be held in Seattle, Washington. The dates are August 10th through the 14th. And that's going to be the 40th anniversary of Fonz, uh, the birthday of Fonz. So hopefully you guys start making your plans. It's going to be an exciting uh, conference. And uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a little thing as far as how I hooked up Francis to, to actually twisted his arm to do this for us. <laughs> um, I was in Williamsburg about two weeks ago and wanted to talk to Francis because we haven't talked in a while and all of a sudden for an hour straight he was just revealing all this stuff that I didn't even know what Francis was doing and so uh, what I want to do is uh, introduce Veronica Salcedo um, who was our vice president at Hampton Roads she was an ex uh, bonds trustee and she will have the honor to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Francis because um, uh, Veronica is a graduate of William and Mary and hopefully um, you could talk about your experience there because a lot of people don't realize uh, the conditions around surrounding William and Mary. So Veronica, it's on you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks Ray for uh, getting us started. <clears throat> and thank you so much everyone for being present tonight. I, um, I, I had a hard time. I, I have so many things I wanna say about Francis. All good, mind you, I'm not gonna drag a brother through the mud tonight. I, 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 I am, I'm so ecstatic to have this opportunity. I really am so um, happy to introduce you all to Francis, who I consider a gem. He is uh, a scholar activist who looks out for his students currently and past students, including me, a non-student. I never had the opportunity to take a class with Francis. I never had the opportunity to um, take that opera, take that, that step into declaring a minor in an interdisciplinary or ind independent study with the guidance of, uh, or the mentorship of Francis. So I feel um, just blessed to have his friendship, uh, his mentorship um, and inspiration to continue doing what I do outside of Women Mary. So now that I've jumped around and totally confused you, um, I wanna introduce you to the current coordinator of the Global Studies Program at William and Mary. Um, he has put forth so much effort with the love and support of students, past and present, to build, uh, of over 15 years, to build the Asian and Pacific Islander American Studies program at William & Mary. Um, he has also served both the campus and his students as a program director of Africana Studies from 2012 to 2016. So if you can think about just what, the span of 15 years is a lot of time, and there's a lot of ups and downs. I'm sure Francis will be happy to um, share more in detail, but um, 
I, I never want to for us to lose sight of a, a person who is humble and uh, relatable in so many ways and at the same time so accomplished um if if you take a moment to look through his bio you'll probably notice that he is a palanca award winner um, to the Philippines' most prestigious uh, literary prize. I remember driving up to William and Mary to catch the performance of When the Purple Settles um, and chatting with friends uh, over uh, after, after the performance at um, one of the local um, bars uh, uh, on campus and just reminiscing and thinking with friends like, why can't we get more of this? Why can't we have more engaging, um, expansive, creative, diverse, uh, ways of thinking about art uh, on stage. Uh, Francis brings that, um, and I, I know that was 2009. That's how long ago uh, we go back. <laughs> I've been receiving an education uh, through Francis's work with his students on stage, as well as um, working, seeing him engage with students to the present. Um, I remember still taking my students as a faculty uh, sponsor of the Bayside High School Filipino American Cultural Association and then later Asian American Association. Some of my students still fondly remember uh, Francis's performances. And, um, you know, because of Francis's work on stage and off stage, I'm able to bring students to, to Women Mary and show with pride um, an, an, a campus that fulfills my dreams. The, the things that I couldn't have as a student, I at least can show my students the opportunities that are available here in Virginia. Fast forward now, I am uh, currently a PhD graduate student focusing on uh, that, that, that goal to finish that dissertation um, in sociology, concentrating in race, gender, and sexuality. And still, I took a moment to uh, touch base with Francis before taking that leap um, to leave a, a rather comfortable job at William and Mary. Oh, comfortable job, Ooh, did I just speak that into existence? A comfortable job at Bayside High School to take that leap and to go to Atlanta and, and study uh, at Georgia State. And I remember touching base with Francis again, just kind of like throwing out ideas and, and figuring out where and how and to do this grad school thing. Um, and so over time, as he's balancing and juggling many things, um, an accomplished artist, an accomplished administrator, a passionate educator, uh, father and husband, um, he makes time to touch base with folks, like including myself, who may have questions about how best we can activate and engage not just ourselves and our intellectual uh, curiosity, but also our community. Um, so I will pass it on now to Francis. Thank you so much, Francis, for joining us, for all your advocacy, your work. It's an honor to have you here tonight. Thank you, Brian. Um, as I load up the, the slides, thank you everyone for having me here. Um, <clears throat> what um, an amazing honor and joy, first of all, to reunite with Alan since 1998 uh, from Heart of the Sun, where I did, where we first met, where I, when I played um, General, Generalissimo um, Emilio Aguinaldo in Tim Cordova's uh, Heart of the Sun. Uh, and so we go back to, you know, when we still had Uncle Fred and of course, Auntie Dorothy and the whole Fonts community in Seattle. Auntie Flory was her name. Uh, one of the aunties, uh, that's where we lived. We, we, I lived with Auntie Flory and three other cast members in Seattle. So for all our elders in that community and nationwide, uh, I, I pause to honor them. Um, I also wanna pause before um, we start uh, with my palm on my heart uh, to honor the Rappahannock, the Pamunkey and all the native people uh, on whose land we now have the fortune of uh, these opportunities that Alan spoke of. So we honor our indigenous people um, and we apologize and are grateful to them. Um, thank you, Vron, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, this is just a talk story, cuento cuento lang, uh, sharing, uh, hopefully not too much pain. Uh, I won't focus too much on the hard work. We all know this country, it's called the USA. Uh, we don't need to regurgitate what is already obvious that all of us have experienced collectively, simultaneously. It doesn't matter where we go, it's still the United States of America. Uh, for all that's good and not so good, for all that's joyful and painful about it, that's all a given. And I think at the end of the day, after 16 years going to 17 years, it is that Manong mentality, it is the OFW mentality, it is the intellectual humility that my parents 
uh, imbibed in us even before the term was invented that I think is apparent in all Filipinos. That's made me survive, not only survive, but I would say thrive. Um, so this is the story of our community. And we start the story with the fact that we even have a logo, this beautiful logo. Do you see the screen? This is called the Asian Centennial Flower. But the thing is, there are three flowers here that make probably a new flower. On the outside, you see the hibiscus representing the Southern Hemisphere of Asia. And of course, our Pacific Islands, the Melanesia, the hibiscus, Gumamela in the Philippines. The inner flower is the lotus. We used to just have the lotus, but then when we thought about it in the very beginning, we just had the lotus as our logo, but then we're Pacific Islander. And even if our Pacific Islander isn't as strong yet as a program, as our Asian American component, we wanted to honor them. And so it's actually the wider frame that represents in the hibiscus. The lotus represents of course, East Asia, and as we know, the lotus travels from as south as India to as north as China and Japan, that it, it, trends, um, it travels. And then innermost, you could call it the jasmine, you could call it the sampagita, you could call it the ilang-ilang. Again, the heart of it is India, Philippines, and wherever these flowers go. And collectively, it could be the waling-waling that grows in Indonesia. These flowers, the very middle, you could see in the style that it represents Islamic traditions like the Moroccan uh, tiles or Middle Eastern Alhambra uh, tiles that we see. So even aesthetic wise, the big round frame that's slightly askew represents again, how not everything is perfect, right? That this is a different way of looking at the world. That's why it's not centered and reading at normal circle. It's a circle, but then you even have to tilt your head. And this represents our perspective that we view the world differently and that we're proud of it. Um, and then the, the, the stamp goes to all the different printing stamping traditions that are all over Pan-Asia. And I say this because I think it's important. Uh, the outside words are so crucial. The Asian centennial at William and Mary, 1921 to 2021. Those three texts are not supposed to exist this logo is not supposed to exist, right? Not in 2021, not ever. It was not a part of the plan of Thomas Jefferson. And back in the day when William and Mary, William of Orange and Mary of England chartered their school in uh, the colonies. But here we are celebrating the first student named Pukau Chen or Chen Pukau, uh, who was a scholar of the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship where, um, you know, I'm not that educated yet on it, but you know, the Boxer Rebellion and all the armed resistance that happened there were back then when China was a republic, the United States and other European countries had a good relationship enough with China to help it out of that rebellion. And somehow the United States invested close to either, I have to look at the figures, it's almost 300 million or $30 million. Maybe in today's dollars, it's 300 million but they gave a lot of scholarships, sort of um, the pensionado system almost uh, to Chinese students. So before we go to the, the centennial, um, Veronica, thank you for prefacing the Asian and Pacific Islander American studies. The fact again, that there is a website now under global studies, right? Global studies means Asian and Middle Eastern, Asian and Pacific Islander, all these. You don't see African, African-American or Africana studies here because we have been able to strengthen it so that it is now a self-standing program and soon to be in the next year or two, it will be the department of Africana studies. In academic parlance, the di distinction between program and department is massive. Uh, for those of you who are not that familiar, a department has a consistent budget. It has the right, not only to hire faculty and staff, but also it has the right to grant or not grant or reject tenure or even fire. A program is basically a commonwealth or a little colony or almost an orphanage of like-minded people from departments creating a unit in their free time, or maybe they get $1,000 to 5,000 if the school is well budgeted and they, they create a program. 
they carve it, we carve it out of our own time, usually volunteers. Uh, I, I would see that the academics are nodding. But in the big picture, the programs are at the mercy of the departments. So that's really instrumental here to note that Africana Studies is soon going to be a department. When I started Africana Studies, and please, I, uh, I just want to affirm here that I am not patting myself on the back. I am only stating point of facts. Um, and if there's any point of pride, it is only pride and hard work. Uh, when I started Africana Studies, we only had two jointly appointed faculty. One was half economics and half Africana. One was half music and half Africana. After four years, I left Africana with 10 more faculty who were half of something else because they're joint appointments. So I multiplied it by you do the math. From two, I left it with 12. Also, when I started it, we had half a cubicle and half like a large storage closet for an office. And let's say a little dining room as a conference room. When I left it, we had the entire half of the first floor of Boswell Hall, formerly the racist scholar chair of history's building, whose name will never be mentioned anymore, right? So that building is now called Boswell, who is a gay alumni of William and Mary, who founded queer studies at Yale University, John Boswell. So this is all the transformation that's happening at William and Mary. So I, when I was working on Africana studies and expanding it, I was mimicking what Manon Larry, what Manon Philip Veracruz, what Uncle Fred taught us and what the third world liberation strikes of San Francisco State University modeled for us. And that is coalition politics, solidarity politics, alliance. So I told this very clearly to my colleagues, the founder of Black Studies was on the feasibility study group that I founded on my first year as an untenured assistant professor. I created a feasibility study about the formation of Asian American studies in 2007 and invited the founding director of Black Studies, Jackie McClendon, and all these big wigs, right? I've only been there for two years, the audacity. But the thing is, I told them, if you won't let me do this, I will have to leave. Because if you don't let me do this, I cannot stay. I have to create a community that recognizes my own story as a point of scholarship. Because how can I face the students you want me to bring here ostensibly? I was hired as assistant professor of world and multicultural theater at a time in 2005 when the dean and the president, the new president, um, were really looking to diversify William and Mary to exceed its 10 to 12% diversity rate. So that's what I told uh, my chair in my contract. I said, if you expect me here to convert KKK descendants so that they would love diversity, that's not how education works. I am here to educate those who want to be educated by me. I am only here to teach those who have been waiting for someone like me. I am only here for those who want to join me. And whoever I recruit, my recruitment is actually not to convince people to take my class, but I will be like a fire alarm or an SOS or a, a light in the ocean where the ships are afloat, like a beacon, right? Again, not that I'm so bright or, or that, but this is like an SOS. And sure enough, we issued that SOS and they came. But while I was doing that, I was active in Black Studies. I taught African-American theater as part of my theater of diversity class, which was called Dramatizing Diversity. Now, what is a Filipino doing teaching African-American theater, teaching Latino, Latina theater, teaching native theater? Because this brown Asian is a Californian. Because in California, from kindergarten to 12, our education, though imperfect, has always been the most diverse. When I migrated to Los Altos High School in 1987, Miss Gazelle Shop gave us the freedom to pick because we had to read Catcher in the Rye, we had to read the Arthur Millers, and he gave, she gave us one free pick, and I picked Native Son by Richard Wright. And she cried in tears and hugged me. 
I didn't know why she was crying. What she didn't know that I share with you now is that I graduated primary school from Abuja, Nigeria after living there from 1981 to 1983 as my parents and my extended family were pursuing the African dream. So in addition to my passion for literature and drama period, I do have experience living amongst the majesty and power that is Africa. And when we say Africa, that's also separate from Nigeria. I have lived in spaces where black bodies are not colonized in the postmodern way because they were colonized. So fast forward the coalition with black studies, expanding Africana studies, my colleagues in Africana studies, humoring me and seeing the cosmopolitan and global approach that I was doing in building Africana studies so that I was not only focusing on the stories of Black people in the Caribbean or the United States, but Black people, African migrations into China, African Black uh, seafarers going into East Co West Coast India, the Indian Ocean, right? So that I was having a global approach, uniting Asia and Africa. This is not unique. This is the non-aligned movement that happened in Bandung when these countries didn't want to be stranded between the war, between communism and capitalism. So the most, um, you know, I've only been here for a year at Global Studies. I'm now in charge of basically the whole world studies except for Africana, which thankfully is a hallmark program. I will tell you that there were deans who tried to say, why don't we put Africana in global studies? And I said, are you kidding me? That would be interpreted as erasing a civil rights hallmark. Africana studies, black studies needs to stand on its own. Just because it's self-standing doesn't mean to say it's not part of global studies, right? It actually means it's stronger. Why is it stronger? Because European studies only graduated three majors. Africana studies now graduates between 15 to 20 majors a year. When I started, it graduated one in 2012. When I left, I graduated eight, right? So even Africana studies. So in Asian American studies, how did this happen? Um, before I leave this website, I want to show you again uh, that this is a global thing. It's not just about educating uh, white people or Asians in America about Asians in America. We also want these Asian Americans and white Americans and African Americans to go back, to go to Asia, to experience life where people don't necessarily dream about opportunities in America, where Asian people are building their own spaces where they were born and raised and what those spaces look like. Places that are not centered on America and its exceptionalism and America as a, the hope of the world, because that cannot be. The whole world has to be hope unto itself. And true enough, our students who go, courtesy of this nearly half a million dollar project that I've raised funds for since 2017 through grants I've written with the Freeman Foundation, they come back amazed at all the perspectives, at all the cultures, at all the humanity that they're able to observe. So that's the Freeman Intern Fellowship in Asia where we basically have a competition and students become Freeman Fellows in Asia. Uh, they get between $5,000 to $7,000 depending on the cost of living, which covers their travel, their food and everything. So this program was my dream after I was able to create with students APIA, the next step was globalizing Asian American studies. And of course, it involves Asian and Middle Eastern studies. Uh, the other thing is Asian and Middle Eastern studies used to be East Asian studies, meaning China and Japan and Middle Eastern studies. Uh, my first Freeman grant that I secured in 2007 was uh, 375,000 to create a feasibility study to merge it so that we could reclaim all of Asia before the Cold War cut it up, right? Even the term Middle East, we now say Middle Eastern Southwest Asian students. So these are the three system, systemic ways that uh, we've been fortunate enough to collaborate with faculty and students to diversify the approach of studying Asian spaces and Asian peoples. So, the big uh, news out of uh, William and Mary this year is 
we graduated for the first time students in an Asian Pacific Middle Eastern Southwest Asian ceremony where we had our own donning. Again, the coalition and solidarity that we have, African Americans welcomed us into the donning of the kente, you know, the kente cloth. Filipinos, uh, allies, Chinese, Latinx, Chicanx, Chicano people, students, they, we all were able to wear the kente. But now William and Mary has a separate, separate ceremony called the lavender for queer people, uh, ceremonia de raices for the Latino Latina community, Latinx, and now the APM ceremony, which we hope to call the Catalampay. What is the Catalampay? It's three words, right? This is not official yet. This is my proposal. After researching with my colleagues in um, East Asian studies and Middle Eastern studies, I combine kata, which is, you know, the Dalai Lama gives the white scarf wherever he goes when he receives and says goodbye to people. It's a prayer scarf of goodwill, auspiciousness, auspiciousness compassion. That's called the kata. In uh, Palestine, of course, the black and white and gray scarf is called the kufiye, but that's too, uh, in my consultation with the scholars, they would rather we use the hata because of its closer uh, etymological relationship with kata, right? Which of course is Sanskrit based also. Um, so you have the kata representing both the Middle Eastern, Southwest Asia and South Asia, and then the alampai right? The alampay or panuelo or panyo. In UP, when they graduate, they have an alampay, which is not like the Maria Clara. An alampay just means any cloth on your shoulder. It doesn't have to be lace or ganchillo or, or things like that. So I put those three words together and we will propose to the students to call it the katalampay. Again, a pan-Asian thing. Uh, the Color purple was chosen by the students because it represents maturity, leadership, uh, regalness as a tribute to the countries of origin. Uh, it also represents the queer uh, rainbow um, because you know it is a diverse community. And as you can see over there, the flower is present. Uh, this is the first appearance of it. This is the filled in version of the, of the Asian centennial flower. So Asian American studies, the first student, his name was Edward Hong, Korean American. Um, uh, he was a feisty leader. He was the perfect partner. Uh, he was full of agency. He did not act like a student. He could call out and, you know, he was like a Korean Larry Itliong, right? He, the way he spoke, right? He would even yell at me. And I had no problem with that because I needed someone like that, right? If you're, if, if I was channeling Manong Philip, he was channeling Manong Larry, right? Two approaches, right? Because in America, you can't be peace, peace, peace all the time. You can't be Om Muni Muni Maha Muni, Om Shanti Shanti all the time. Uh, I've discovered that in America, two things. Yesterday, I heard the saying, the crying baby gets the milk. I don't like to cry, he can cry. <laughs> Uh, or the other thing too is that in America, unless someone believes that you're angry or that you can be of harm, they will not listen to you. It's power politics. They would listen to the student. And that was Edward Hong. That was his bravado and sort of fierce in your face kind of leadership that he could back up with administrative acumen. So we named the Edward Hong Prize for Student Activism and Leadership in his honor. It's the only award that we only give to first year sophomore and junior students because Edward was a leader from his sophomore year. So we don't want students to start leadership on their senior year. Uh, and of course he's amazed. He only graduated 11 years. There's already a prize in his name. So it's also training him to do well in life because you know we're waiting for the endowment to back up this prize, right? <laughs> Kidding, not kidding, right? Like we aspire, everything is aspirational. Uh, and then our two majors who were Hassan Ali and Abe, they're South Asians. Max Nicole can resuscitate it. You see how very spare it is in 2013, there's nothing there because I went on sabbatical leave in nine and 10. So when I there was no recruitment happening and Hassan and Abe were first year students when Eddie was there. So they graduated when I came from leave. But these are the times when I almost left William and Mary and I went to the Philippines for two years on an extended sabbatical. Uh, this is one of the tumultuous times at William and Mary when Jean Nickel was fired, uh, supposedly for administrative uh, sort of uh, disability or, uh, or um, 
efficiency, but research has now shown that basically some old guards or old money didn't like the fact that he had an in serious intent to diversify William and Mary, right? That's now finally coming out officially. So in 2014, this student, Max de Kulken, he wanted to major in it. He was Thai American, but I said, nope, you can't major in it like Eddie or Hassan or Abe because it's not sustainable. You need to bring me at least five students so that I can do this independent studies with you in my own time that William and Mary doesn't pay where I give you all my Friday mornings for 15 weeks for free. It's not sustainable. I'm willing to do that, but for between five and 10 people. Back then, 2014, he came back with 200 people. Where were those 200 people? They were in something called a Facebook group that I've never even heard. I was already in Facebook since 2006, but he created a Facebook group and the members had to affirm that if there was an Asian American studies program that they would take classes, that they would support it. And the main ally in the building of that was my TA in my, was, was a student in my course where Max was the TA. I taught a class called Asian American History in Action. And Max was my TA and there was a Filipino kid named Paula Tienza who was a business marketing major who didn't know theater from Adam. He said, this is arts, I'm in business marketing. Uh, how can I get a name this class when I'm not a very good actor? And Max said, well, we sat him down and he created the branding for Asian American studies. He created a presentation, a pitch. He created an elevator pitch. He created the first logo. He created the Facebook group. He ran the Facebook page. He, he, this was the first time that I even heard in 2014 of the word, what do you call it? Facebook metrics, right? All of these data sets that are coming and analyzing what's the best time to put a post. We were already working Facebook before all these sort of, before the Russians were on it, I think. We might have beaten the Russians and whoever is trying to use Facebook for fake news. We were doing Facebook to create this ethnic studies program. Paul was so successful that in 2015, there were two other graduates with him. And then in 2016, there were three, including the first Asian American councilman of Williamsburg was our alum. Uh, and you can see it grow. I go on sabbatical. Do you see, there, there is a trend here that I, I need to point out that I had to go on sabbatical in 2017 to 18. So that's why when I came back, sorry, um, when I came back, there was only, there were only two majors. And so I had to start recruiting again. And so in a way, I do have colleagues who are supportive, but at the end of the day, uh, so far, yes, the program is still sort of dependent on me, right? That's just a reality. Uh, so that's why my goal is to recruit, to train and recruit the next generation of people so deeply commuted to, com committed to uh, community building like Jam Dows, like Roberto, uh, and, and, you know, Vron, uh, April is at Norfolk State, but I'm also a mentor to April Manala. We are, we just graduated five people this year. Next year, we're graduating six. In 2023, we will have our largest at eight. But in 2025, I'm bound to go on sabbatical again, right? So my fear, I hope that it will not go down to two or three, but that we're able to maintain the upward trajectory even when I'm no longer here. Because it's not a guarantee that I will be at William & Mary forever, right? I do, I do have other options and I might change my mind. Uh, so that's why I'm also so happy to be sharing this with the community because even if not all of you are alums or affiliated with William & Mary, you are in Hampton Roads. This is a part of your extended community in Fonz. So these are the two winners of the Hong Prize. They are, as you know, they're juniors. Actually, she's only a sophomore, so that's an error there. And they're amazing leaders. Um, I wanna share with you the memory of our dear Stephen Enriquez, formerly of Williamsburg, uh, but his father, Dr. Enriquez, has since moved to, I think, South Carolina, medical doctor who used to work at the Veterans Hospital. Some of you might know him. Stephen Enriquez uh, uh, passed away in 2012 after finishing law school at Buffalo. Um, in his suicide note, 
it was basically the fact that he felt he had shamed his parents by not even getting into William and Mayer Law School and that his clerkship was not in a major city, but was in an upstate suburban town. So we honor and we tell the story on the permission of Dr. Enriquez, because this is what he wants Stephen's legacy to be, for everyone to know that everyone is enough, especially the students. And so every commencement, my speech is very simple. You don't need to come back to William and Mary bringing a PhD or a lottery prize or anything grand about your life. We just want to see you. You are enough. You, your happiness should not be dependent on accomplishments. This is what uh, Dr. Enriquez, Stephen's father, wants to share with us. And so we created this fund to recognize potentials uh, in students like Maysin, who is Khmer Filipino, who demonstrates intellectual maturity beyond her years. She is just phenomenal. So um, she's the first recipient of the Stephen, we call it the Stephen Prize. This is the class of 2021. Uh, Luigi is, uh, parents are Dr. and Dr. Almirante of Riverside and Eastern Virginia Medical, uh, uh, Medical Center. Uh, he has a twin named Miggy. They're both going to, to med school. Uh, Luigi's going to EVMS. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude, and he received the Tomoko Hamada Prize for Applied Scholarship alongside Zoe Marquez, who has a double major in psychology and APIA. And Zoe is going to go to George Mason to take up her Master's of Social Work. Marcus Bengzon, uh, Cum Laude, double major in philosophy and APIA. His big project was diversifying, challenging his faculty in philosophy about their lack of diversity. And as a result of Marcus's efforts, philosophy hired for the first time a specialist in Buddhist philosophy. You can imagine at William and Mary how major this is. They are yet to hire a specialist of African philosophy, right? Because it used to be that they used to say that Buddhist philosophy was religious studies. They finally recognized Buddhist philosophy as philosophy. And as you know, in, in art history and art, they used to say that African or African-American art was anthropology, right? They, they used to refuse it. Well, they still haven't hired an, art, uh, an artist or an art historian to do African or Black art. But now we have an Asian centennial distinguished artist in Asian, Asian American art, who, who I will uh, introduce later. Jamela Jacob is our valedictorian. She did the high honors on the Lumpia Filipino, self-orientalism in Filipino Americans. Athena Benton, uh, she is going to explore farming after she graduated. She's the most philosophical of them all. We are very proud of all these graduates uh, and the fact that they are all going to grad school. They have, they, see the big picture, right? They know what their purpose is in life and it extends beyond the career. Um, I used to joke uh, that the every, you know, these students, if you talk to them, it would look like they're always either running for public office or the final five of Miss Universe because they have their platform speech down pat to two minutes. Now, Presenting the Asian Centennial, some of you might have heard of Art Matsu. Art Matsu was Japanese Scottish. Uh, they moved from uh, Scotland to Canada, from Canada to Ohio in the early 20s. Um, he was a quint quintathlete, if there was ever such a thing. Uh, so he, this is him wearing, is that, yeah, that's baseball. He played baseball, he played football, he was track. Uh, he was a swimmer. There's one more I'm forgetting. Um, he, he had five sports and he was also into theater and he was a leader. He was in all the, in the seven and 13 secret society. He became a assistant coach at Princeton. Um, and he also worked at Rutgers. Actually Rutgers was the place where he worked the most. He is the first person of color to be president of the American Gridiron. For those of you football fans who know what the Gridiron is, it's basically the association of football quarterbacks. And he played with uh, Walter Achu with the Dayton, uh, Dayton, Dayton, what are they called? Flyers or he played with, you know, Walter Achu, the Chinese, was he Chinese American? Uh, the first Asian was Walter Achu in football and Art Matsu went on the same team. We thought we were gonna celebrate in 2024 because that's when he matriculated. 
incidentally, as he entered, uh, we have documentation in the Richmond Times Dispatch, the gossip columns that say that the delegates in the legislature rushed the Racial Purity Act because they were so afraid of white women falling in love, to put it mildly, with this phenomenal athlete, Art Matsu. Why did he get welcomed? Our thesis by Benny Zhang, one of our students, is that uh, they gave him the excuse based on eugenics, that they were counting on his better white, right? That his half white erased whatever deficiency his quote unquote Japanese-ness or yellowness had. But then in 2019, in October, our researchers at the library found in the yearbook that somehow missed my, my hands, um, because actually we did know about Pu Kao Chen, but there was, our focus was Asian American, but we did find more information. This guy right here, Chen Pu Kao from Shanghai, again, the boxer scholar, the boxer indemnity scholar, he also played tennis. Uh, back in the day, it seemed all the students were into tennis and sports. Um, he even has a picture wearing the traditional Chinese garment. And um, so right now, we are researching him. Uh, it's kind of delayed because of COVID. We were, we've been planning, but then COVID hit us. So we lost all that time of research. Um, we have been covered locally. Uh, the announcement of the centennial has been well received. We received uh, seed money of 50,000 from the provost, which I have since doubled. I have raised an additional hundred, actually tripled because if I doubled it, I would have only raised 50,000. I have since raised with my partner, Dinesh Sahoni, at least 100,000 from the university so that our budget now has risen to 150,000 for the centennial. And most of that is going to Filipinos. I'll tell you a bit why. So just be careful who you share this recording with. Uh, it was not, uh, it was all random how it played out that much of that, that budget went to Filipinos. This is our committee. Uh, our honorary chair is Michael Tang. Um, and then we have Mirza Beg, uh, who is on the BOV. Michael Tang is a, is a, what do you call it, venture capitalist. Both of them are venture capitalists. Michael Tang owns the Dunkin' Donuts franchise in China. He is our alum. And this is Dinesh Sohoni, who is my uh, partner in crime, co-chair. Uh, Max, this is Ivana Marshall, who is the director, ass assistant director for diversity affinity group. So you will be working with Ivana. She'll likely reach out to you after I give her your email, if you let me. So we have a 20 person uh, committee. Uh, this is Steve Prince, um, esteemed artist who has done a lot in helping us secure uh, a very uh, astute uh, commission for our distinguished fine artist. Attorney Professor Vivian Hamilton, one of our active partners in the law school. The law school has been our staunchest ally. They have since done like four programs, including bringing uh, Congressman Bobby Scott. So here's the timeline. Um, Ming Pan was the second student. Both of them are boxer indemnity scholars. Here you have Art Matsu. The first woman of color so far on record from William and Mary is a Japanese American from Washington DC. And we know she's Japanese American because in the yearbook, it clearly says Hatsuye Yamasaki of Washington DC, right? Very nuanced, right? This is 1933, she enters and she wins election as president of Brown Hall. Remember, it's supposed to be against the law. It's supposed she's not white. But again, part of our research is finding out how did these Asian, Asian Americans manage to be enrolled at a time when Jim Crow law, laws were uh, full steam, right? Uh, what our research is showing is that there, there are three eugenics in the case of Matsu, um, foreign, right? The foreign category, the boxer indemnity, the relationship with other countries, the fact that they are not Americans and maybe they are not covered by these racist laws. But then the third one is the gray area that based on their, it's basically the model minority that their quote unquote yellowness or brownness was overlooked because of their capital, whether it's intellect, leadership, prestige. Again, in the yearbook, wherever her name is, Washington DC is right there. Um, in the case of Ashgar Ali, on record so far to be our earliest um, South Asian alum who majored in chemistry, uh, in the flat hat, it says that 
there's a feature profile on him on the day of his birthday. And then it also shows that, like all things William and Mary, Asghar Ali has royal connections. His father was close to the king of Afghanistan, one of the king of Afghanistan's um, advisors. In fact, when the king of Afghanistan was successfully assassinated, Asghar's dad was right next to him. And the flat hat writes this as an accomplishment. Right? So you can see what the flat hat is trying to do there. He may be brown, he may have dark hair, he may be from that place so far away, but his dad died next to a king, right? Remember William and Mary? We're all regal and royal here, so he's okay, right? And his American name in the article, they always say in the second paragraph, he goes by Oscar. Asgar becomes Oscar. So this is our task um, or charge from the president of the university to honor the legacy of Asian Pacific Islander Americans to elevate their impact. Um, the third one is kind of getting controversy because how can we make Williamsburg cosmopolitan? We can make it multicultural, but I don't know about cosmopolitan. You all have lived here longer. I'm sure you've been trying for ages. Um, and that we go by the values that uh, are flourishing and belonging. Um, this is here because our president is so vested in the centennial. We, you might have heard, I don't have the slide here, that we now have called the arches of our football field, the Art Matsu Arcade. We had to get permission from an Art Matsu family. We could have done it without it, but the president was adamant in reaching out to the family of Art Matsu. So much so that she did her own research and appointed people to do it and made phone calls and she would check in with me. In October, 2020, I received three to four phone calls from the president of William and Mary on her personal cell phone, updating me on the progress that she was making in staking out the family of Art Matsu. So on the presidential level, we really have a serious commitment and um, I can't say enough about President Rowe. We were also APIA, the first ever luncheon she, accepted. We were probably the first and only one to invite her, but she came to our banh mi, you know, Vietnamese sandwich, banh mi lunch, and she just sat there for one hour having sandwiches and, well, she had the, the vegan egg roll, um, the fresh roll, uh, guay con, uh, but she just sat there for an hour with APIA program faculty and students in September, a month into her uh, tenure. These are our major projects. We have the research project, which of course, I'll tell you what we're finding out. My colleague Dinesh Sohoni runs this with students. Uh, the aforementioned art fellowships that I will elaborate uh, later. We are trying to raise funds for professorships because like I said, when I go on leave, unfortunately those numbers will go down, right? Because right now there are only two jointly appointed faculty in APIA. Bene Farao, who's from Goa, also a Bruin, UCLA Bruin, teaches in English and APIA, and myself. In a year, we're supposed to teach four courses. So two of those courses for Bene are in English, two are in APIA. In my case, it's the same theater and APIA, but all these admin work that I do means that I get deducted one course. So right now, in fact, I'm only teaching one course a semester because otherwise I can't add four more hours in a day to do the centennial work, right? Um, our other big uh, plan is to gather a convention of politicians, community leaders like all of you to have a symposium in Williamsburg that our BOD member Mirza Beg wants to do at the what do you call it? The House of Burgesses, to have a state of Asians in Virginia uh, convention, right? Where we can map out a vision for what we want life to be for Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Middle Eastern, Southwest Asians in Virginia. Uh, the global impact, we are working uh, with inviting basically uh, speakers from um, embassies or whatnot regarding uh, national, international issues. Right now, our top of the line there is Myanmar. Human rights abuse, the military dictatorship in Myanmar, the violence on everyone in Myanmar, the Iran crisis, um, and of course, the Southwest 
uh, Philippine Sea, Southwest China Sea dispute. These are our three priorities for the global impact that we're facing. And of course, number four, COVID. Um, and we are raising scholarships for our students. Never in my 20 years of academic teaching have I seen such need in our students, no matter their race. Um, in terms of the APIA students who are here, um, faculty and students of APIA met with admissions because we were concerned that about four years ago, all of the Asian students we were getting were pretty much well-to-do. They were pretty much middle, e middle income and up, right? We didn't see working class Asian Americans and we knew that this was a discrepancy, right? Why do we know that? Because why would Asian American lead exist in the DMV area if there are no lower income uh, students of APMS uh, descent? So because of our outreach to them, telling them you have to disaggregate the data, do not hire or do not recruit only model minorities, we now have Asian American students from working class we now have Asian Americans who are first generation, but the problem is William and Mary has diversified the people it's bringing in, but the resources and the infrastructure remains white, right? So that's why we ourselves are the ones raising scholarships. We ourselves are the ones raising for professorships because all these diverse students are coming in and where do you think they're gonna go? They're gonna go to me, Dinesh, Bene, and my colleagues who are basically volunteers. So we're inundated now. The critical mass of students are there. Now we cannot support all of them. And so why do you think I created this? Asian centennial, because the currency of the United States is exceptionalism. So amazing, William and Mary, one Chinese student entered in 1921. Let's use that platform to benefit more Asian Americans, minoritized people of color, while you get your self-congratulations for being so diverse, for receiving a, bi um, a boxer indemnity scholar. We will use it to the benefit of our people, right? I didn't invent this. This is what Jose Rizal taught us. Now, these are the events that uh, we're missing about five of them. Uh, these are the events that we've put up. The one in orange, RB Apostol, is a childhood friend of the Attorney General. I, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm in the community, so I can share this with you. Um, Rina Beth Apostol, for those of you who are aware of Sacramento, Berkeley, Rina Beth is the daughter of Sorsi Apostol. I'm sure somebody here knows Sorsi. Sorsi Apostol, Sin Bonta, they are the organizers of the Philippine National Day Association in Sacramento. Sin Bonta is a community organizer who is the mother of the current Attorney General of California, Robert Bonta, Rob Bonta. So RB grew up breathing the same air as the Attorney General of California. This is basically like fun Sacramento. It's PNDA, and I just think that's amazing. How are we able to have her? Because of Zoom, again, making lemonade out of the lemon that is COVID, right? Making lemonade out of calamansi. Uh, we also had our first uh, solidarity event celebrating, uh, as you know, the Lemon Project is a research about reconciliation and enslavement. Um, I, like I said, that's Dr. McClendon there in the red blazer. These are my family here. Theater hired me at William and Mary. I came to William and Mary because of theater. I stayed at William and Mary because of Black Studies, because of this woman right here, Dr. Jacqueline McClendon, the founder of Black Studies, who from the get-go nurtured, nourished me academically, gave me a community, uh, gave the staunch support of the Black Studies program towards the founding of Asian American Studies. Uh, without this woman, without Black studies, there would be no APIA, as with civil rights, right? Again, didn't invent it. This is the story of the United States. Now, the big research find. We know that we, our student, Sumia Yotsukura, found this just a month ago in her research. Our Chen Pukao documented his experience as a Chinese Asian student in the United States. Uh, allow me to read you in his own words. And I'd like to ask a question to give you a break from my speaking after you hear this. I am afraid this wonderful demonstration at San Francisco 
and its irresistible effects upon our minds were directly responsible for the subsequent disappointments and mental depressions of many of my companions as well as myself. As we rode from the Pacific coast eastward, the vast desert area could not but put me in mind of scenes which I had witnessed in my ride from Peking to the Great Wall, and which I thought were without parallel on earth. There, my air castles began to evaporate. Imagination took flight, and doubts began to set in. I wondered if the rest of the country would be like what we had seen at San Francisco. I'm from California. Every day, this is how I feel living in Virginia. All of this work that I have presented in front of you is exactly along the sentiments of Chen Pu Kao from 1921. All of this work is to simulate San Francisco of what Pu Kao Chen arrived to in 1921, because as we know, it was so far ahead in 1921 for people like us. Just want to let that sink. It's about a five page article about 2000 words. We are processing it right now. We will be issuing a public news release and some video. We will um, disseminate the research. It will be a part of the work of our distinguished artists. Um, there will be an exhibit um, on, on this work and we know that we will find more. So. So we honor Chen Pu Kao. We have a proclamation from the Williamsburg City Council. And right now we are coordinating and hoping that the governor will make the same declaration before the elections and that maybe the next governor will do the same thing. Uh, this was done by Benny Zhang, who's our alum, who became the first Asian uh, council member of the city of Williamsburg in collaboration with Caleb. I forget his name. Uh, there's another student who's also on the city council. And we would, we have requested through uh, Sean Sorries uh, that some of you might know and asked if the governor might do the same. This is our biggest project, sustainable, that it's not all the horse and pony show, see how great Asian, Asian Americans are. We are in academia. So we would like to make the case for Asian American studies and ethnic studies to be in K-12 in the Commonwealth of Virginia by creating the CASE initiative. Um, on a local level, we have been doing this work by volunteering at local schools. Our professors in Latin American studies do Latinx, Chicanx uh, sort of uh, outreach programs, but we would like to systematize that. We would like the Commonwealth to make this be a requirement. Um, so that my colleagues on the bottom there, that's again, Professor Sohoni um, and Professor Jason Kim of the School of Education and the coordinator of social studies curriculum in the School of Education is an Asian Americanist, Dr. Esther Kim, who received her undergrad from UCLA again, like Dinesh and myself, and her PhD from UT Austin. Uh, my other colleague, Dr. Uh, our Benedito Bene Ferrao is also a Bruin. So there are four of us Bruins on this. Again, it, it's not random, right? This is what we were trained for. We couldn't all stay. My students would tell me, professor, of course you had to come to Virginia. California has enough of you. <laughs> you need, um, and my colleagues in California, when they talk to me, they say, Francis, just look at it this way. You're doing the Lord's work. But what if you don't believe in the Lord? Well, you're doing some work, right? Um, and in the long term, um, 
when we met with Sean, we quoted the governor's own quotes when he issued executive order number 39, that the full history of Virginia is complex, contradictory, and often untold. And we must do a better job of making sure that every Virginia graduate enters adult life with an accurate and thorough understanding of our past and the pivotal role that the African Americans have played in the building and perfecting of our Commonwealth. So we asked Sean Sores, there should be Shouldn't there an Asian American Pacific Islander Middle Eastern Southwest Asian version of this order? Quoting, giving the very words of Governor Northam back to him for our community, especially in light of the rise of anti-Asian violence. Here we go. Here come the Filipinos. Um, the, as you know, film is the greatest educator. It is not only the greatest entertainer, it is also the greatest people gatherer. It is the sexiest fundraiser. Um, everyone can relate to film, right? Uh, we're also doing music, by the way, but we, we didn't appoint a music. I wanna say that our student representatives have secured the largest student government funded concert in the fall. They have a group called AMP. Uh, Isabella De Fulvio, who got the Hong Prize in the beginning, Within 24 hours, she secured the $20,000 commitment for the fall concert to be assigned to an Asian, Asian American artist. Unfortunately, Bruno Mars is like 20,000 a song, so we can't get Bruno Mars or even Apple. Um, but Marisa Arroy, who many of you know, Marisa, uh, and that's how she goes. It's not Marisa, it's Filipino, it's Marisa. Marisa is an Emmy Award winner for Seeks in America. Many of you know her we have endowed her with a $20,000 film fellowship. That all goes to Marisa, the 20,000. It does not include the budget for the film. Now, I don't have the budget for the film, but this woman holding the camera, Lisa Crawford, who is the director of William and Mary Advancement, meaning fundraising. She's the director of video services at Advancement, okay? She doesn't have money also. What she does have is a staff of five to six editors, cinematographers, animation that she has convinced her boss in fundraising advancement at William and Mary to throw seven people's jobs behind this film. That is how much support we're getting. That $100,000 I spoke with you about, that doesn't include all this donation. That what we're doing is not this Asian Centennial Com Committee is not a service provider. It is a coach. Let us help you do right by the Asian American community, which includes people in your community. One of the filmmakers in Lisa's team is Myanmar Burmese American. Lisa is Lisa Figueroa Crawford. Her dad is Filipino. Not many people know that at William and Mary, but she and I have known it since she came in, right? So imagine Marisa Roy didn't know this. Then when we had the meeting, I just told her, Marisa, look, another Pinay is your co is co producer. I'm the executive producer, and Lisa is the co producer. She's bringing the whole film studio with her. This is the equivalent of Sony Pictures telling me that yes, they're gonna make my film, right? So we hope for a 30 minute film that will at least be shown on the local PBS. And maybe it will be picked up by Frontline or who knows. And what I told Marisa is, this is not about you making an industrial. An industrial is a self-promotional film, right? This is not an in-house industrial, Marisa. Like I, Alan knows, as I said, I, I used to be an actor in Hollywood, et cetera. So I told Marisa, Marisa, this is not an industrial. This is not in-house. This is from you as an Emmy award-winning filmmaker with your own artistic agenda. Do what you will with all this research that the APM Research Project, like I just have read to all of you, I'm your executive producer. I just want the Asian, Asian American story of William and Mary to be told in however you deem it can impact a wider space of communities. You have done this before many times, Marisa. And maybe I didn't tell her this. Who knows if we if she gets an Emmy for it? Right. But that's the film. Now, this guy right here, I've known this guy since he was 19 years old. 
I met him when I was the keynote speaker, the end closing night speaker of either Dialogue or the one that happens in October for Find at Virginia Tech right after Cho Sang Hui. And somehow this kid with, with the 70s haircut back then stuck with me. Uh, he would visit me in Williamsburg to the point that in 2009, Roberto Hamora actually created a bespoke art piece collage that was the poster for my play that Veronica Salcedo referenced, uh, When the Purple Settles. Since then, we have kept in touch. I had been quietly following his career. And when I had some budget to hire somebody for one course, I called him and said, would you apply? It's just one course. It's the beginning, summer course. So now we have been able to secure close to $20,000 in an art commission in a collaboration between my program, APIA, Global Studies, and the Muscarel Museum and the Department of Art and Art History. So Roberto actually has two contracts. He has a contract with the Asian Centennial APIA Global Studies, and he has a separate commission from the Muscarel Museum. And just today, I can confirm to you that the artistic director, managing director of the Muscarel Museum has committed, and I want to see his face, um, has committed to purchasing one of Roberto Hamora's existing artwork to be put on display at the Muscarel Museum in Williamsburg, Virginia, at the College of William and Mary. This is an addition to an original print that Roberto will make for the Muscarel, the total of which will then be divided in half so that Roberto can still sell his own work while the Muscarel can raise funds and sell and do what it will with those share of print. On the APIA program part, Roberto, I think it was two pieces that he'll make for us, a print, same thing, another print. The two pieces will be about Roberto's interpretation and expression of the Asian American Pacific Islander Middle Eastern Southwest Asian experience at William and Mary and he will create like I said before he will elaborate enhance to create a katalampai so that the other all the cultures will be more visible on that purple stole that he will layer and work with students right it's not just Roberto because he will collaborate with students in creating the fabric that will for hopefully for hundreds of years be bestowed upon graduates of Asian descent at William and Mary. So we have every intention of leaving our mark on this institution so that our people will not be forgotten. And finally, Rina Beth Apostol, she did a master class. She is our distinguished theater fellow sponsored by the theater department. She will be flying in October where I will be directing her in an original solo cabaret musical night where I hope many of you will come to celebrate Philam night. We already have it. I'm announcing it here. It will be original. Rina Beth is phenomenal if you've never heard of her. She basically is the go-to actor in San Francisco for any Asian woman, trans man part. She's the go-to of magic, of Berkeley rep, uh, Asian American theater, uh, American conservati conservatory theater. And then in April, uh, she will, uh, what do you call the word for this? Uh, she will revive her performance of as Afong Moy. For those of you who did not know, Afong Moy is the first Asian woman immigrant to the United States. Unfortunately, it was by way of her parents selling her to an American carnival act where she was put on display in a case for her bound feet. So it's very similar to the Venus Hottentot. So Lloyd Se already made a play about this, which won the much lauded Lorton Price. And I will be directing uh, a version of the Chinese lady uh, with uh, Rena Beth in April. Uh, she also already did, she worked with nearly 20 William and Mary student actors in individual 30 minute acting one-on-ones in addition to three two hour Zoom workshops about the industry from creating your website, your agent, uh, creating an image, outfits, racism in, in the industry, et cetera. So all of these uh, took place already. and. These are our dream speakers. We already did have Representative Bobby Scott on April 8th. 
Uh, we would love to have Helen Zia. None of them know this. Again, this is just dreaming, right? Uh, if you were to ask me um, what made all this possible, I think it was all those nights listening to our uncles and lolos and even me singing the impossible dream, right? Um, so don't tell these people that they've been invited, uh, but this is Spivak, she's big in literary history. Uh, Viet Tan Nguyen, of course, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner. DJ Prashad is, a, is an esteemed historian. Um, so these are our uh, prospective guests, hopefully uh, we'll get some of them. And the university has committed for the three main pomp and circumstance ceremonies, convocation, charter day, and commencement to have Asian American themes or speakers. So right now I'm working very closely with the university. And by that, I mean the secretary to the board of visitors of William and Mary is our advisor. So all my emails copy the secretary of the board and the chief diversity officer of William and Mary, Dr. Sean Glover. This is how invested William and Mary is. So the chief diversity officer reports both to the board of visitors and is on the presidential cabinet. Likewise with the, uh, Mr. Michael J. Fox, who is the secretary of the board. We email them directly, call them directly. That's why in a way the sacrifice of our forefathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, Uncle Fred, Auntie Dorothy, all of your families, all of those of you who have been in the Hampton Roads, it all led to this. And I thank you directly and indirectly, it has impacted it. And the few and many times I've been able to go down, Vron inviting me to the high school. The first time I met Tracy when I did my one person show where those high school students saw an uncle become an auntie. Uh, in front of their eyes. Um, it has all led to this. And I have had all of you in my mind wanting our community to be proud, wanting your children and grandchildren to not to come to William and Mary and see themselves immediately without even trying. So that is the end of my presentation. And I thank you for this opportunity and for your patience in uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Oh my God. Oh, wow. You belong on the East Coast, my brother. <laughs> You're an inspiration. Thank you very much. Oh my God, Francis. Wow. Wow. I'm happy to take questions, comments, songs. <laughs> We can stop the recording too if you like, so everyone can be more candid. I'm always candid.